Hello, everyone. Welcome to our introduction to character design. My name is Marianella Perry. I am the Senior Art Pro Fellow at New Bedford Creative, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Before I go any further, please enter your first and last name in the chat, along with your email for our records. If you are sharing a computer, um, both people watching can submit that information from the same computer, that's fine. Um, and then for a brief overview. So this peer-to-peer -peer series is geared to enrich, educate, and connect creatives within our community. New Bedford is the home of artists, creatives, change makers, designers, entrepreneurs, and community enthusiasts. And the peer-to-peer -peer session also embraces the pulse that makes New Bedford so unique while also expanding our knowledge and connections. I'd like to take this time to thank Mass Development, TDI, and the Bar Foundation for funding this program. This, just, this is just one component of a broader TDI Creative City initiative to boost arts-based economic development. I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Roger Andrews, graphic designer, who will present to us about character design, but more specifically about fundamental elements. So I will pass it over to him. He'll be sharing his screen and he'll give us a little bit more details of who he is and what he will present for us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to come join the session. Um, again, my name is Roger Andrews. Uh, I am a graphic designer, but I'm also a, um, an illustrator and uh, essentially a commercial artist. Um, I wouldn't necessarily class, classify myself as a fine artist, although uh, some of the work is, uh, I think I do is, is fairly fine um, in detail, in that, in, in, at least in that regard. But, um, but yeah, I'm a commercial artist. So when you talk about economic development as it relates to art, my entire career has essentially been that. Um, I spent the last couple of decades essentially drawing for commerce, drawing for pay, um, drawing for uh, specific projects that are uh, direct connection to corporate clientele. And um, as you see, as I do my presentation, a lot of it is um, specifically focused in the toy and game industry. Um, I spent the last several decades doing a lot of artwork for Hasbro Toy and Games but I've also done some work for uh, video game companies all over the world, um, including Rovio, and I've done some stuff for, um, for PlayStation, for uh, you name it. I've done it for a bunch of different companies, uh, Disney, um, DreamWorks, a bunch of things. And so I'll share that. But again, my, my main focus and goal is um, client service. And, um, and I work with a lot of uh, brands and a lot of sort of um, pre-designed uh, intellectual property characters. And so over the years, I've kind of gotten a good feel for what makes good character design. And hopefully I can share that with you guys and you can get a kind of get a sense of like my take on it. And, um, and, and again, in the end, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, this is in effect my, um, for lack of a better describe, way to describe this, my little slideshow of uh, my illustration work. Again, Roger Andrew Illustration, that's, um, that's my uh, company. Uh, the website is rand247.com, rand247.com. If you want to kind of see the uh, portfolio of images, some of them will be reflected here. But as I mentioned to you guys, Hasbro uh, Twin Games is probably my, my number one client. Uh, I've been working with them for the last, uh, God, since maybe over 20, certainly over 20 years. I want to say it's maybe 2001. So yeah, 22 years now. I've been working for Hasbro. And specifically what I work on is uh, character design as it relates to their existing brands, um, product design, and also packaging design. Um, so we essentially provide the visuals that you'll see uh, when you go to the supermarket or when you go to the toy store or you go to Target or Walmart and you go down the toy aisle, a lot of the stuff that's reflected here, and hopefully you guys can see this okay, a lot of these little characters and things that are some of the uh, characters I've worked on over the years for the uh, for Hasbro and their various brands like GI Joe and uh, Transformers and you know My Little Pony, Little Pet Shop, um, you name it, even Monopoly and 
<laughs> all these other characters. So this is kind of like a representation of sort of a lot of the work that I've done for them as a, as a company. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, a lot of the work I do is in, in packaging. Um, so for years and years and years, like again, some of these may be familiar to you guys, um, if you have children or, uh, or bought gifts for, uh, for relatives, um, a lot of these things might be familiar. And this is a lot of, I've had my hands on every single one of these in terms of doing the, the uh, preliminary designs and sketches for a lot of these uh, packages and package designs and product designs. And so this is a lot, oftentimes what I provide the client, in this case, Hasbro, is my sketches of characters or scenes, or in this case, individual, like these were gonna be for the figurines, for Clue, the game of Clue, um, uh, renderings for the uh, layouts of box covers and interiors, character designs in terms of what, uh, what they would look like prior to render. And as you can see, this is how they turn out in the end, the final render based off of these sketches. So essentially my role at the company is more along the lines of the very, very earliest stages of product design and development. Um, they often bring me in, companies bring me in to do the sort of um, the brainstorming sessions, the sort of like what things are gonna look like um, and what things are gonna play like oftentimes as well. I get called in to kind of be that, that person at, at Hasbro to kind of to lend my artwork to kind of help support the marketing and the designs uh, concepts of the art directors and the, and the writers in, at the company. So I'm kind of basically, I'm kind of um, in a lot of ways, kind of the middleman between the, the concept, creative concept and what eventually winds up on package. So as you can see, again, video game stuff, um, a lot of these sort of preliminary thumbnail sketches kind of that get turned into these really ultra developed ones. Um, again, this is, this is along the line of uh, toy and game stuff where we actually do the, the figurines or in this case, the, the actual figures for um, action figures for, uh, and this, in this case, it's figures plus, uh, plus the uh, packaging art. And again, you can see where it comes from. This is my art. This is where it winds up in the end. Um, and so over the years, I've done a number of visuals. Uh, as you can see, I've got a whole collection. Oftentimes what happens is it's a process. Um, I know a lot of artists, probably a lot of, a lot of artists on this call, it's kind of uh, uh, lonely, right? It's kind of singular. You do all the art, you present it, you market it yourself, and, um, and you manage and maintain your clientele. In, in these cases, a lot of the times, it's just, I get brought in almost like a hired gun to kind of lend my talent in with all the other talented people in the company. And we have a concept uh, that we all sort of work together as a team to execute. And so this is kind of a collection of images that are reflective of a lot of team effort to make these, uh, to make these products come to life. Actually, I'm pretty proud of this one, the re redesign of, uh, of uh, operation. This is, I mean, just about everybody in the world has played this game at some point. Um, and as you can see this, I've done quite a, quite a collection of characters over the years. And that's why the, um, I thought character design would be kind of my best and uh, best case, best use case scenario for, for you guys to kind of get a sense of, of what I do. Um, again, most of it is existing, you know, IP, you know, Superman is Superman, but you know, you have to take Superman and, and draw it in a unique way. That's where I come in. Same thing for Batman and Spider-Man and all these other characters where I kind of have this pre-established style that I render in that um, is relatively identifiable over the years. And so a lot of companies kind of come to me to kind of deliver that specific style and apply it to their specific product. And that's kind of where, where I, uh, I feel like I shine. So I'm gonna dip into uh, Procreate, by the way, I know a, a lot of fellow artists, um, and I, I would ask this question if I were on, like, you know, what do you use? What do you render with? Um, what are your tools of choice? And for me, um, I made the digital conversion. I was almost all analog for uh, the decades. Um, and at some point, I just decided that I'm gonna go all digital. 
And so everything I render and everything you'll see, um, mo actually most of the stuff that you've seen already has been, was actually rendered on the iPad. So that's kind of like my primary tool. But I spent, you know, obviously decades just working pen and paper, magic markers, and that's how I would kind of achieve those uh, concept, those concept drawings and designs. Um, so to the presentation, character design. Um, the reason I call it the good, the bad, and the fuzzy. Um, the, and the thing about character design, and one thing I've noticed about a lot of fellow artists, um, whether they be um, kind of elementary to art or aspiring artists is a lot of them are kind of unaware of what makes good character design. And um, so what I, to that end, oh, by the way, Sketchy Goichi, that's my little, that's my little, uh, if you wanna follow me on social, uh, Sketchy Goichi. Um, so to that end, I wanted to kind of have like a little sort of intro demo into like what makes um, good, bad and ugly, or in this case, fuzzy design. And, um, and how to identify it. So let me start off with the good. So if we look at this collection of existing, pre-existing IP characters from Superman to Gamora, to you know, Optimus Prime and Mario, right? They're all instantaneously identifiable if you have any kind of connection to pop culture and uh, video games or anything like that, that's in that sort of pop cultural realm. These characters are immediately identifiable and it's, they have certain qualities to them that make them so. Um, some further examples. We have these characters here, you know, your Iron Man, your Lion-O, Superman once again, Shazam. There's all sort of identifiable features that would make you almost instantaneously look at these characters and know that they're good guys, right? There's just something inherent about each and every one of them. And I'll be honest with you, it's not really a mystery of why they are the, you know, universally considered, or at least at a glance considered good guys, right? Same thing goes for the bad, all right? So we look at these collection of characters, again, immediately identifiable characters in pop culture. And there's something about them when you look at them that feels um, inherently bad. <laughs> Right? Just at a glance, right? There's nothing good about this. There's nothing, this, this, these characters are up to no good. This, it's clear and evident right, right away. And I'm, gonna, I'm here to tell you that there is a reason and there's a rationale behind why these characters look the way they do. Same goes for this batch, right? Everyone on this page is clearly evil or up to no good. And there's a reason why there's, there's something about them that, that makes them so, all right? Same thing goes for what we call, what I'm calling the fuzzy, right? These are the cuter characters of the world. You know, the characters, again, you know, your, your uh, little Grogu or what everybody refers to as Baby Yoda, you know, your Powerpuff Curls, you know, your Disney characters, you know, your Bluey, all of these characters, even, you know, good old uh, Puss in Boots, right? When you look at them, they're instantaneously identifiable as cute or soft at the very least, or, um, or friendly, right? Same things goes with all these guys, right? Instantaneously. And I can tell you there is an actual rationale and a formula to all of this, right? So what I'll do is I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna start with the good. I'm gonna take this page, actually I'm gonna take this page here. All right. Actually, this one's better. All right, so if you look at these guys, right? I'm gonna demonstrate why these characters are all, what, what is the unifying force with these characters? And what it all boils down to in everything and everywhere in, as it relates to character design is basic shapes. So the reality is everything that I draw is off of a platform of these three basic shapes. Everything, including every single character that I just spent the last like minute and a half showing you, right? And of these three basic shapes, the, the, the square or rectangle, the triangle or sort of sharp edge shape, or the circle or oval, every one of those are reflected in each one of these characters and they define what makes them, in this case, 
good, bad, or, or evil. And then we'll call this, we'll call this the fuzzy, but it's really just cute or fuzzy, right? Those, those three attributes are, are reflected and should be identifiable if you wanna create good character design. So again, we'll take a look at, uh, I'm gonna diminish this a bit. All right, so Iron Man, automatically. Hopefully you guys are seeing this, okay? What, what is reflected here? That square shape, all right? Same thing with, same thing with this guy, Lionel, square, right? Even there's a, there's a squareness even in through the shoulders, right? Certainly for Superman, he might be the squarest of all in, 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 many, in, many, <laughs> in many ways, right? And I think, you know, and again, I'm no psychologist, and I think what it is with these characters is, and what it is about that square shape is stability. I think there's something about that blocky shape to characters that denotes stability and trust and leadership. Um, is the only way that I can describe it. So whenever I'm generating characters that I want to be heroic and, and, and inhibit those characteristics, I always start with a square shape. So, for example, all right, so there's your square shapes. So for example, if I'm gonna do a character that is um, strong, and I'll just even start up with upper, upper torso. There's always squareness to the jaw. Hope you guys can see this okay, I'll zoom in a bit. always like that's my platform to start from and everything has this sort of like squareness to it can you guys see it i hope hopefully you guys can see it can you guys everyone can see okay yes okay good right, there's the squareness to that character and earnestness for, for lack of a better, better way to describe it and that happens over and over and over again and if you can learn to identify that it'll be extremely helpful whenever you're rendering characters so let me uh let me clear that all right same thing same rules apply obviously for what is the bad or the evil um, let me pick one of these. I think last frame has the best examples. All right, perfect example, right? So we established that this, this triangle, for my opinion, in my opinion, the triangle or the pointed shape is for some reason reflective of edginess. There's an edginess edge that happens when you, when you include these points. And what I've noticed over and over and over again, and this is very strongly reflected here in these characters, is the, thing, the way that things come to a point, hopefully you guys can see it, is very reflective of kind of being not, maybe not so trustworthy or perhaps dangerous, right? Hopefully you guys can see that in the render. Like there's, there's a level of danger that happens when you have these sharp shapes, All right? And if you can incorporate these whenever you're doing your original character designs, they'll be reflective of that emotion you're trying to capture when you're creating characters. And the reality is every single time you create a character is all about storytelling. And if you can tell story by having these edgy, these edgy shapes, things that come to points, you're immediately gonna start seeing like there's, there's this sort of natural inclination to see these characters as evil or, or doing wrong or up to no good or whichever way you wanna look at it, right? 
this character is not no longer good, right? Hopefully, all we all rec recognize that that character is no longer good. And I think a lot of it comes from the pointiness and the edge and the shape that you can capture with that um, by having that, all right? And then lastly, uh, let me clear this. Is we'll go to the fuzzy section here. Perfect example. Now. What happens is circular. For whatever reason, we'll pick a uh, pick green this time. For whatever reason, when let me get on the right layer, make it visible. For whatever reason, the more circular, or um, for lack of a better way to describe it, um, there's a softness it becomes softer and and rounder. The more of that, the more softer and rounder you get these characters, the, the more um, inviting, the more um, uh, friendlier, the more uh, cuter, the more less aggressive, less, uh, um, what's the best way to describe it? Less intense. And each of these characters, you notice there's a circular quality, there's a roundness to each of them. And that's important to note because in order to capture true cuteness, I've discovered is I almost always, and I mean always, no matter how cartoony or how realistic the character is, I almost always start with a circular shape, regardless of where everything lands on that shape. We can see the green okay on the gray here. Right, no matter what happens, These, these shapes start with a circularness and I've round off everything I can to maintain that sort of, um, sort of the cuteness of it. And hopefully this is coming through guys. Right? But it all, again, all of it, all of it stems from circles. And that is to me the key element to be able to recognize um, those three factors. If you can, in every case, sorry, I don't wanna rename it, I wanna clear it. Clear, in every case, if you can identify the block, the sharp edged, whether triangle, whatever shape, or the circle or oval. It will allow you to, at the very least, start your, um, your character with a proper base, you know, of, in this case, we'll say strength or leadership or stability, right? Then this one's sort of that edgy or, you know, or, uh, or evil or up to no good. And then finally the cute or softer edge. If you start with that as your base for every single character that you render or choose to render, you, you honestly, you can't go wrong. And let's see, this is that, uh, all right. Does that help? Hopefully kind of get, get the gist of what I was referring to. And um, also there are places where this kind of this hybrid of um, for, lack, for lack of a better way to describe it, like this sort of mixture, sort of there's a, where you include sort of the strength of the rectangle or slash, slash square, and you infuse a little more roundness to it. And in infusing the roundness, you actually uh, cutify or uh, soften and or make or bring sort of youthfulness to some of your character designs by simply sort of softening some of the areas and some of the, and some of the proportions in a lot of ways to find that sort of the roundness of it, to kind of make something that would be hard and organic or, or mechanical, and as this case may be. And you can turn that into something that is, is, is basically, right, more uh, cuter or more or less aggressive. And let me see if I have some good examples of going the other way. Uh, so these are good examples of, so the cuteness, 
Then there's also a way to take something that is inherently smaller um, and cuter and add a little more edginess to it. Now, I don't know if you notice it here, there's lots of sort of sharper edges that have infused in this character. Even something as um, simple as the brow of this Iron Man character where it's got sort of like a, um, it's kind of an upturned sort of sharp edged. You notice there's actually, there's a lot of tri triangles in here, a lot of edges in here. And that's what gives this character a little more edginess. Whereas he's supposed to be this kind of little shortened version of Iron Man for the toy, but he's got a little bit of edge to him just because I've added some edge, just by adding some, some sharpness to it in certain places. And it happens throughout um, that sort of that theme or that, that philosophy. I've kind of used that throughout pretty much everything that, I, that I've worked on over the years. Again, right, he's, you know, he's not super threatening because there's a sort of, there's a roundness to him. But at the same time, I've infused some edginess, some, some sharper edges, because he is this little devilish character. And that sort of gives him sort of like a less, you know, he's cute, but he's not so trustworthy. Same things for all of this, all these items. It's, again, supposed to be cute. So they have that sort of roundness in the, in the proportion, but there's some edginess where there needs to be. Yeah, this is, this is looking good, Roger. Awesome. I've learned. <laughs> Yeah, right. A lot. Um, I don't know you if go. you're ready for us to yeah, open yeah, it up for questions now. All right. So I'll yeah. first start with the questions that are in the chat. And then if there's any more questions to add, we'll we'll address them. You're welcome to come off of mute then. I do, I think I see one in there now. I'm curious to learn more about your career and how you came to be a commercial artist. What advice would you give to others looking to enter this field? That's a great question. That is an awesome question. Well, I mean, I've been doing it for so long that I've kind of passed through a couple of sort of generations of, of um, illustrators. Uh, you know, when I first got my start, I mean, I literally got my start in the 90s. Um, I actually went to art school in Boston in the uh, early 90s and graduated in the mid 90s. And then I got a, I started a career in advertising. I was one of two um, uh, illustrators who were staff guys who worked at an ad agency in, in Boston for years, I did this for like six years as I kind of cut my teeth. Um, and I was doing purely like television storyboards and I was doing advertising for, you know, name brands like, you know, uh, car companies and, uh, you know, I was doing Infinity and I was doing AT&T and uh, Subways and a bunch of different, like, I was just doing ad art and I was doing that forever. And then I actually simultaneously, I was teaching at my alma mater, my art school. And one of my students graduated and got a job at Hasbro. And, um, and he's a phenomenal illustrator. I'll shout him out, Chris Ford. Phenomenal illustrator. He basically worked there for years, but he brought me into Hasbro. He actually, like, you know, he remembered me as his teacher and he liked my work and he appreciated, like, my creativity. And so he brought me in to do some assignments for Hasbro. And that's, that was it. That was the spark. It was a complete, complete like, um, career shift. It, it turned me from being, again, a traditional illustrator doing, um, you know, car ads and uh, restaurant ads and retail store ads to being a guy who actually gets to draw what, in effect, I've been drawing my entire life, these, these cartoon characters and these, these video game characters and these, um, you know, these uh, comic book characters, I've been drawing forever. So the fact that now I've had this outlet um, in this commercial space, in and in, I'll be honest with you, a pretty, pretty lucrative, um, field and I just kind of fell into it. Just happened to teach the kid who brought me in uh, to the to the industry. Um, and then, so in terms of other people breaking in, I will feel, fully admit um, this is so specialized. Um, being a commercial artist, that it's very very difficult for me to give direct one on one advice on how to break in. But what I can say is, like style, I think is probably going to be the thing that anyone on the call is going to want to um, hone in on and identify for themselves. Their own personal voice in how they render and how they draw and how they create and how they paint, I think to me is the, the distinguishing factor to anyone having, their su having success as someone who wants to earn a living as an artist. And um, hopefully it was evident in some of the art that I presented, there's a distinct style you know, that I render in that is um, marketable. And so what it's allowed me to do is to take what is natural for me to render and, um, and it just happens to speak to the clientele. And so 
for me, you can't force that. You kind of have to, like, it's, it's a product of all your influences as an artist and what you like to render and, what, and how you like to render. But you have to, in, in, in my opinion, to survive in 2023 and beyond as an artist and to make money doing it, you have to have a distinct, recognizable style. And, and something that is market, marketable to just you. If you have that, I think you're pretty bulletproof as an artist. You can, because you, can, you don't necessarily want to be a mimic of someone else. Uh, you certainly can be influenced by other artists, but you don't want to be necessarily a mimic of someone else because you're easily replaceable. Um, and then if you have something that's identifiable, even if you have a small tr amount of traction at the start, I think it'll do you benefit long-term, you know? And to answer Margo's question, to break in, it's like every other artist right now, you just have to have your Instagram and you have to have your Facebook, your Instagram and, and be constantly uploading images um, and only your best images. Don't put the stuff that uh, work in progress, put some, put some stuff that you're really, really proud of and, and see if you can build an audience through that. Um, I have another question that came through from Tony. Um, I'm trying to understand blending colors. What would you say is a good, what would be a good practice or material to study? All right, for blending colors? Um, well, I mean, blending, I guess it depends on the medium colors, you're working yeah. on, right? I mean, if you're blending colors in oil paint versus watercolor versus magic marker versus graphite versus charcoal, um, for me, blending colors is massively easy um, because, because, and solely because I work digitally. Um, and not that, again, I can break open um, a blank uh, Procreate, which is my app of choice uh, on the iPad, and I can blend colors at will using any medium, any fake digital medium uh, on, through the app. I can render stuff in watercolor. I can render stuff in flat vector lines. I can, and so, um, or, or I can render it in airbrush if I really wanted to blend from one color gradient to another. Um, so I, I don't know if I can really answer how to, blend beyond, um, without knowing the specific medium that that person is working in. Um, and I'm not really necessarily an oil painter, but I do know, I mean, obviously it's, it's a dilution of, it's a dilution of color. And there's, and there's an ability to see um, both ends of the spectrum of what you're blending the color from, from whether it be from dark to light or from warm to cool. Um, it's just a matter, yeah, oh, said acrylics. Yeah, I saw that, so acrylics, I mean, Again, I'm not a painter per se. I mean, everything I do is digital, um, but I do know and seeing people render in acrylics, it's it's just the dilution. It's the dilution of the um, media. It's it's how to properly dilute it to make it to allow it to blend from one to the next. I think that's it. That's the transition point. How you dilute it, whether it's water based or oil based or whatever it is. Uh, I think acrylics mostly are water based. It's how you dilute it to be able to allow you to smoothly blend from one color to the next. I think that, think that answered the question. Hope. Move to Florida and come help me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that must be Tony. Is that Tony? That's Tony, yes. Absolutely, yeah. No, I mean, I, okay. I, I wish I could. I wish I could, could be down in Florida, especially today being up here in the Northeast. You touched on this in answering Tony's question about technology. So, you know, you have your... Um, and, and by the way, like we are, Roger, you and I are similar ages. I graduated college similar time as you. So the technology has definitely changed. Right. Why, anyway, why are you aging us, Marco? <laughs> no. why, why, put some, why put a number on us? Come on. We now. look great. We look great. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm curious. Do, I mean, would you when you say breaking into because I know we have a lot of um, a younger generation very much interested in this field. I know it's highly competitive and you need to be highly skilled and talented. Um, but if there are certain programs, even starting in in high school or or middle school, that you would recommend, like. I, I see your art and your field being really attractive to, to many, many young people. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, in terms of like, when you say programs, you mean like actual um, uh, avenues for people to go down? Or do you mean the actual like specific programs that I would use um, to render with? Both. So, All right, well, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, obviously programs like this would be helpful to actually to attend and to seek out um, different 
venues and different avenues for you to be around other artists and to be able to bounce, uh, you know, bounce your eyes and ears off of them. And also, but even more importantly, to absorb some of their knowledge, I think is the most valuable. I mean, the, obviously, you know, not to compete with a, a program like this where it's, it's actually one-on-one, -on -one, but there are like, you know, master classes and there are things you can pay for from established artists. Um, and then there's also like, of course, there's the ubiquitous uh, YouTube. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, YouTube, there are like quite literally millions of artists on YouTube um, giving a massive amount of free content, basically giving you like working sessions, showing you exactly what brush they use, what medium they use, what program to speak to programs. Like for me, I like Procreate um, as a program. That's um, an uh, iPad only app. Um, but of course I've used Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator and you know, and InDesign, like I've used like the Adobe Suite over the years, so I'm familiar with that and well-versed in that. But, um, but to be honest with you, I think it's, it's a combination of doing programs like this, where you actually get some one-to-one -one, one -one interactions, asking tons of questions, being open-minded, but I also think it is seeking out artists who inspire you and figuring out ways to sort of break down how they render, because you're never gonna be able to mimic it perfectly, but figure out how they render, and then see if you can kind of touch, touch the sky, touch to get as close to their excellence as you can within your own style. Then once you've established that, and, and invariably it happens over and over and over again, Margo. Artists, like I have artists that I've like studied and worked from growing up that allowed me to get to the level of proficiency that I have now. But at some point your own personal style takes over. It happens every time. But everybody needs that spirit animal that's sort of like, or a series of, like a whole zoo full of spirit animals of, of artists that they can be inspired by and then really study what they do and really be self-critical of how you render as it relates to that professional. Not harmfully so and not negatively so, but really see, all right, well, I'm not achieving that, but why? This person can draw feathers and they look like feathers. Why? What are they doing? And then really study and spend the time trying to figure that out. That I think to me is the most effective way to kind of grow and to break in. Fabulous answer. Thank you. Yeah, I don't want to, I have a million questions, so I could just keep going, but I want to open it up, Marianella, to see if there are any other questions anyone else has. We have people from all over the world here today. So awesome. Italy, yeah. Italy. Oh, Italia. Welcome. Yeah. In fact, Margo, just to kind of keep the, um, keep breaking the ice, do you, you want to ask, ask away? I've got, I, I'll try to answer as best I can. Well, you know, I, I'm going back to Tony's question and, um, I would look if you're not from, so we're in New Bedford, Massachusetts right now. Um, uh, Roger, not, you're not too far away from us, uh, in Rhode Island, right? No, I'm actually in Westport. Oh, nice. Oh, you're really close. I'm, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm born and raised in New Bedford. I'm from New Bedford. I just, we just, we just live in Westport. All right. So I just want to do a plug for New Bedford Creative. You know, we know a lot of artists and a lot of artists teach either small group classes or one-on-one -on -one lessons. And there's some organizations that do that. So no matter where you are, you know, I would hope that you could find some mentors and teachers in your area and, um, and utilize them. But the YouTube yeah, like, yeah, you can find pretty much anything for free on YouTube. So if you don't have the resources to pay for, for art lessons and whatnot, then, then that's definitely a great place to start. I'm curious to find out, do you think it's necessary to have an art degree like nowadays? Is it worth that investment or can you come about it other ways? Well, here's the thing about an art degree, um, and I'm torn because I actually taught at UMass for the last several years uh, in the illustration department, and uh, and so I'm I'm on the fence, right? I benefited from having um, that sort of that undergrad, post high school, additional time at art school. I benefited from it. I think, and I'm please don't take this. It's going to sound enormously pretentious. And, 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 old and self, self uh, grandizing, but like, I feel like I probably could have got a career in art right out of high school. I feel like I was hungry enough and I feel like my, um, 
and it's going to start off with saying, I feel like my talent was at a level that I could have got a job right out of, high, out of high school. However, to be a professional and to work at the level and to, and to have that additional training all day long, like full day long training on how to identify, like what I was trying to show, trying to demonstrate in my presentation, like to see an image and to dissect it and to know what's great about it or, or what's, what tells what makes allows it to tell the story and what it is like that is very difficult to do by yourself it's very difficult to do without that additional training from someone outside of you whether it be a professor professor or an art uh instructor or a program it's very very difficult to do and see on your own um so i feel like if you have because again the field is so narrow in terms of um availability of work or availability of slots as a successful artist, I think you greater your odds, you make your odds a bit greater um, if you have that additional training. Now, maybe it's university, maybe it's not. I just in my time that I spent in the programs that I, uh, this programs at UMass, like I see the value of it. So it's tough to me to say, again, financially, you have to be able to be prepared for that. You know, you have to be aware that that is going to be expensive, that bit of training. But if you're confident in what you do and you have that drive and that determination and you're open and you're humble, I think you have the opportunity to be extra successful when you graduate a two or four year program. You're more likely. And additionally, you have contacts, whether it be, the addition, whether it be the, the, your fellow classmates or your instructors or the administration of those places that you're learning from. There's the, there's the advantage, I think. Like that, like people in the field who've seen your work or people who have come to these um, uh, open houses and have seen your work and they can speak to your, your instructors to talk about your work ethic and your drive and all that. I don't know that you get that by yourself watching YouTube videos. I, I have a question um, in regards to you being like you're a professional. How do you feel about applications like mid journey and people doing ai art because when i see it, i'm like man this is so gorgeous and and i know it comes from other artists but i don't know sometimes i feel like is it cheating like you know, honestly because i think it's gorgeous you know what's really interesting about it like because um all this ai stuff as it relates to uh to art specifically not writing because writing is i feel really bad for writers because they had that oof that's a tough one but for art specifically, you said it best, Tony, it all, it's sourced. Like even the images that are like a collection of, of things to make this beautiful painting, it's sourced from original art, right? It's not necessarily, as I understand it, the AI actually generating new brush strokes and new paint, digital paint. It's, it's it taken this sort of amalgamation of making something really pretty out of it. Yeah, because... I haven't looking at that stuff too. I mean, it looks incredible, but it can only, it's the computer. It can only do what, it can only get the information from a human being. And yes. it can't, it can't make a brush stroke because it doesn't know what a brush stroke is unless you tell it. So. 100%. I, I don't, I don't really, you know, I mean, I'm debating. Until you know, next week, you know, ago. that's, that's the scary thing. Eventually, I just think like with all of us, that's how we learn. Eventually, I don't know. Like you said, you feel bad for writers because it's writing. For artists, I think eventually, I don't know, we used to write on cave walls and now we're all using Procreate or whatever. So I, I don't know, it's just maybe an evolution. Well, you know, to, to, but here's the thing about it though. The one thing, the edge that we still have currently, right, as of 2023, um, creativity. The ability to generate the original idea. That's the part that I feel very confident in humans, <laughs> at least for the, for the short term. Like our ability to create an original concept from scratch. Like you tell me right now, I want you, Roger Andrews, to draw a chicken uh, riding a carrot uh, to Mars while um, you know, wearing a tutu. Like, I'm, like, yes, you can plug all of that into some sort of AI source. It'll spit out some image but it's not gonna be the image that I create, you know? And, and I can give you variations of it just like the computer could and in different rendering styles, but it's original. And here's who you wanna worry about. 
it's not us, not the artists, it's not the writers, it's not the photographers, it's not the people that this is gonna affect, it's the clientele. It's the people who are seeking out images and it's just like, well, it's just easier for me to just use an AI image or it's easy for me to use this copy or it's easy for me to like, just let the, let the AI write the joke. I'm more concerned with them, like the people who just accept. Like over time, that's where we could get hurt as artists is over time where the clientele, the audience is like, you know what, I accept this isn't as creative as it would be as if I asked Tony or Roger or Ralph or someone else on the call to generate something from scratch. But it's good enough. Mm. So I'm more concerned with them than I am with us. Like we can, we're going to continue to be creative and come up with new stuff and new ideas. Um, but it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's going to be a challenge, guys. And, and that's why I mentioned earlier, Margo, and I, I'm not sure if that was a, a chat question or yours, but um, style. I think there is how you, there's the other edge we have over the computer. Is style, if you have a distinct style, now the computer is gonna aggregate your style eventually, right? So it's gonna take my line art and it's gonna say, can you do so-and-so line art with this color style, with that? And it's gonna be able to do a mixture of all that eventually. But if someone says, no, I want this from the artist, as long as there's an audience like that still around, then we're okay. I got a comment over here from Daisy saying, Yay, Italy, everything is clear here. The lesson was very clear and helpful. So oh. I'd like to make sure you, you got that comment there. Awesome, um, thank you. But it is time for us to start wrapping up. So I, I wanna thank you all for your time this afternoon. Um, this was a great session. I'd also like to thank Roger once again. Thank you for all of your hard work.